about medieval China, focusing on the time period between the uh, beginning of the Tang Dynasty and going up to the fall of the Song Dynasty when the Mongols invade. Here are your video goals, and you'll notice there's also some vocabulary off there to the right. Hey guys, so let's start by just looking at a timeline real quick. So uh, we, last time we talked about the, uh, the Chinese, we talked about the Han Dynasty. And these guys were um, a really important and powerful dynasty that lasted for about 400 years. And as you can see down there, uh, they were founded on Confucian ideas, they were able to have a really stable system of government based on bureaucracy, and they were able to develop long distance trade, especially the Silk Road. But after the Han fall apart, there is a long time of sort of decentralization where there's smaller powers and nobody can really unite China. Uh, this is ended by the Sui Dynasty, which then falls apart, and then you see the rise of the Tang Dynasty. And we're going to be focusing today on the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty, both of whom rely on Confucian uh, philosophy, use a system of bureaucracy, and we'll be looking at some other features as well. Um, the Song Dynasty is brought down when the Mongols invade in the year 1276, and then after that we're going to see the rise of the Yuan Dynasty, and we'll talk more about the Mongols and the Yuan later. Once stability is restored by the Sui dynasty and the Tang dynasty then take over, um, you see uh, the rise of a stable centralized government. And the basis of this centralized government is, just like in the Han dynasty, bureaucracy. And this is where the emperor appoints officials, pays those officials, and those officials govern according to the laws made up by the emperor. Uh, because of this really stable system, the Tang Dynasty is able to expand and Chinese influence spreads further than ever before. They're able to expand into Western or into Central Asia, as you can see there on the map, that sort of blob sticking out to the left. And they're also able to expand their empire south into Southeast Asia. And the states down there are, are forced to pay tribute to the Chinese empire. And last of all, Chinese culture Chinese system of writing, Chinese philosophies begin to spread all over Asia, down into Southeast Asia, and also very importantly into Japan and Korea. And we also see a number of practical improvements, including the redistribution of land to peasants, which helps normal peasants and weakens the old sort of conservative nobility. And you also see the construction of the Grand Canal. Here's a picture of the Grand Canal. Uh, you can see on the map there that it connects um, it, it goes, uh, connects the Yellow and the uh, Yangtze River there. This is actually a modern map, so it might be a little bit more extensive than the ancient map uh, that you uh, that that you would see. Uh, here is a picture of the Grand Canal, and just think about how much work it would have taken to basically dig an artificial river connecting the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. And then imagine that they were able to do this um, in the Middle Ages. So after about 350 years, the Tang began to collapse. And this has to do with a number of reasons. Uh, external conflict played a major role. There was conflict with Arab armies out um, in Central Asia. And because of this, and also because of conflict with nomadic groups called the Uyghurs, uh, they lose control of their Central Asian provinces. And there are also internal problems. We, we begin to see increasing corruption, higher taxes, famines, and all of these problems lead the people of China to believe that the Tang had lost the mandate of heaven. And as you know, once a dynasty has lost the mandate of heaven, it is believed that it's okay, basically, for people to rise up and overthrow them, which is what happens. But very soon after, stability is restored by the Song Dynasty. Um, and the Song Dynasty is really interesting because even though they're losing territory and they're eventually conquered, they go through uh, what appears to be a cultural and technological golden age. Let's start by looking at Song society. So 
Song society is interesting because farmers actually were viewed as having a higher status than merchants or artisans, which is different from most other societies. At the top of Song society were wealthy landowners. These guys owned large, large farms, but they actually didn't do any work themselves. Instead, they spent their time um, studying, becoming educated, and then trying to take, take part in Chinese government. But under them, uh, there were farmers who worked on the wealthy landowner's land, and this was seen as being a very respectable position within Chinese society, because if it wasn't for farmers, then there wouldn't be food for anybody else. Um, underneath the farmers were artisans and merchants, and these guys were not as highly respected because they, they were not seen as performing as vital a function, especially merchants who Confucius taught didn't actually do anything. They just moved stuff around. Um, and this limited trade to some extent in the Song Dynasty. Government in the Song Dynasty is pretty interesting. So like earlier dynasties, they apply the Confucian philosophy of government, which believes in hierarchy where superiors care for inferiors. Um, they, and so they use, once again, the system of bureaucracy. Uh, however, the Song place a, a, a large emphasis on education. Uh, they believe that you should rise up in the government not because of your birth, but because of your education. And so in order to enter into the bureaucracy, you had to pass a civil service exam. It's basically like the SAT of medieval China. And you had to study for years and years and years in order to pass this test. And once you did, then you could become a bureaucrat and govern, um, help to govern China. Uh, this, though, was usually only limited to wealthy landowners because education was very expensive, and so only the uh, wealthiest Chinese people could afford this uh, education. One other thing that characterizes the Song Dynasty is rapid technological advancement. On a quick side note, Song culture is widely uh, viewed as being uh, really amazing and worth worth paying attention to. Um, even though the Song Dynasty based itself on Confucian philosophy, uh, you see Song culture is highly influenced by Taoist and Buddhist ideas. And they place a high value on nature, harmony, and they also focus on the brevity of human life. Um, there's a beautiful landscape painting there. They were known for their landscape paintings that often feature uh, mist and mountains and people lost in the wilderness. Um, they're also famous for their poetry and their calligraphy. There's a, po there's a poem there. You can read it if you want. If not, go on to the next slide. All right, so the song are most famous for their technology. And we're just going to run through these real quick, and we're going to talk about them more in class tomorrow. So one really big technology that the song are famous for is movable type printing. And what this is, is it's a system where you basically have a bunch of different stamps, one for every word in Chinese. And you move these stamps around, and you can create paragraphs and books, by, and then create multiple copies of these paragraphs or books very quickly. Um, this is hard because Chinese has hundreds of thousands of different characters, and it will be really important when this technology spreads over to places that have alphabets. But it's still important in China, and one thing it allows them to do is it allows them to print the first paper money, which is very important economically because then you don't have to use gold and silver and copper and stuff. You can just create money. Another really important technology is gunpowder. And gunpowder is used for really one practical purpose, and that is making weapons. And so you see here some pretty, uh, some pretty interesting Song era weapons. On the left there, you see a printed picture of a cannon, a very primitive cannon. In the middle, you see an example of a uh, rocket. So basically, it's, it's a thing with a bunch of arrows stuffed in it, probably gunpowder as well. And then a bunch of rockets on the side. And what you would do is you'd light those rockets and that thing would go screaming off towards the bad guys and potentially kill a bunch of them. And then on the right, you see a diagram for a bomb. That is a big iron ball filled up with gunpowder. And then you light a match inside of it. Um, and when the gunpowder goes off, it sends iron fragments exploding out in all directions. Um, yeah, so gunpowder, big breakthrough. And helps them to ward off northern invaders. Advancements in navigation, 
and trade. Uh, two big ones are the magnetic compass and the junk ship, which is an ocean-going vessel that allows them to uh, travel long distances more easily. And last of all, and maybe most importantly, are there breakthroughs in agriculture and industry? Um, so new agricultural techniques, especially the widespread use of a new iron plow, allow for greater productivity and higher non-farming populations. Because farmers can grow more food, other people can do other stuff. Um, another thing that happens is you're seeing new techniques that allow for the mass production of iron. On top of this, you're seeing spreading use of coal. And all of these things together, higher agricultural yields, more, more iron production, and more coal, look like they're about to go through an industrial revolution. Uh, you're seeing the growth of population, increased productivity, and uh, it's possible that Song China could have developed industrialization, uh, you know, centuries before it, it happened over in Europe. However, it doesn't happen, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But first, let's talk about why did such advancement occur? Well, one big reason is um, that the people who were in charge were educated and valued ideas. And so a lot of the people in charge actually helped to come up with a lot of practical solutions to problems. Also, printing helps to spread ideas. So you can see here, this is a print of people using a puddling technique to produce iron. And once you, uh, once you create that, you can spread that all over and other people can copy that method. Also, you can get these sort of technological feedback loops. So for example, if you produce more iron, then you can produce more iron plows, which then allows peasants to make more food, which allows for bigger cities, which allows for more iron production, which allows you to make more better plows. And so you can see how that is a loop. Um, we'll talk about that more in class tomorrow. Song fall apart just as all the other dynasties do. Most of this has to do with northern invaders. So the first northern invaders are these guys known as the Jin, who are able to conquer most of the Song's northern territory by the year 1127. But the Song continued to flourish in the south. Um, however, in 1276, the Mongols invade, and they are able to conquer the Song entirely. And even though the Mongols do adopt a lot of Chinese culture and technology, the Song, a lot of the most advanced Song discoveries um, sort of go unheeded or ignored. And uh, you see, you, you stop seeing this rapid technological advancement that was going on in the Song period. And so, we can probably blame the Mongols for the Song dynasty not developing into an industrial power uh, centuries before Europe did. Alright guys, so here are your video goals. Thanks for watching, and I will see you all tomorrow.